Hello and welcome to another virtual session of SEO RAS. I'm your host, Daniel Durish from Basta Digital, a digital marketing agency. And today with us is Barry Schwartz, who is a SEO of Rusty Brick and founder of the Search Engine Roundtable. Um, as he mentioned, we can also call him an SEO janitor for the community. So Barry, welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And today we are going to talk about uh, different topics. Mostly it will be a Q&A session. So please ask your questions at slido.com. Uh, you can join us by using the code SEOs or just scanning the QR code. And uh, please add your questions there. And in the meantime, I'm going to start first. So Barry, can you tell us a little bit how did you get in the search engine optimization? And also, did you experience, uh, for example, keyword stuffing techniques and, and different older weird techniques used with Alta Vista and similar engines? Right. Um... So that's a good question. So I've been in the SEO space um, since the early 2000s, like probably 2000 or 2001. Not exactly sure what date. I actually started writing about SEO on various blogs back in 2003. Um, so I've been doing this for about uh, around over 20 years now. Um, I started actually when I was like 20. So uh, I look older than I am, but I'm only around, I'm only like 41. Um, so um yeah, I've been doing this for a while since I've been since since I've been a baby. Um, I don't actually do SEO. A lot of people think that I do SEO consulting. I do not. Um, I have a software company called Rusty Brick. We do software development. Um, so we build based off of like specs. I want to build X, Y, and Z. We build it um, and we build it better. And then um, I find it easier to sell, um, I guess, development services than to sell SEO because you don't really fully control SEO. Uh, Google could release a Panda update or a Florida update or whatever and have an update and then your deliverables are kind of squashed. Um, but it doesn't mean I, I actually have a huge passion for SEO. I've been writing about it um, since, like I said, 2003. I published almost 40,000 articles on SEO and search marketing topics in the past uh, almost 20 years. Um, and I deeply love, love it. It doesn't mean I don't know SEO, obviously. Um, back in the old days, like you were saying, you know, keyword stuffing and this and that with the old search engines, even in the early days of Google, when Google started to like really make um, a wave in the space and really gain market share, it was just so easy to game. I was able to rank for fun just to test out these different link, link networks. Um, some of you may remember if you're in, in the space for a while, the digital point co-op network, um, you can literally rank for anything. Um, so I was ranking number one for mesothelioma, <laughs> one of the hardest, one of the highest paying um, AdSense clicks you could get uh, back in the day. I was outranking a very popular brand for their own brand name, H and R Block, during tax season. Um, all it was was a single page. It was just stuff I was, you know, most SEOs back in the day were like testing to see what works and what doesn't work. Um, so um, it was a lot of fun. Obviously, Google was a huge step forward when it, when it came to how search engines operate, how they rank compared to Alta Vista, Excite, the old search engines. Uh, because that with those were just looking at textual based stuff, what you wrote on your page and keyword stuffing obviously was very important back then. And then Google's like, no, we're going to look at how, what the page says, but also what other pages on the internet are saying about your page. So the links, page rank, the anchor text, and obviously that has changed over the years um, in terms of how easy it is to manipulate. It's probably much harder to manipulate these days than it was back in the old days. But the old days of SEO were a lot of fun. And maybe we could talk a little bit about that versus what it is today. All right, thank you. So maybe you mentioned that uh, you are not doing SEO actually, so you have a software company. So what was your primary motivation uh, for starting Search Engine Roundtable? Was it that you, you were active on uh, Webmaster World forums or how, how did you get into this, into the publishing? So I just, it was just amazing to watch, especially as Google started to like, gained traction in the early 2000s, late uh, 1900, uh, 1999 or so. It was very interesting to watch how the SEO industry and the webmaster community um, was just obsessed about Google ranking updates and stuff like that. Back in the old days, we called them the Google Dance uh, before there was an official Google Dance at the Google headquarters in the old days. Um, but we were basically watch the data centers change, pain drink scores change and stuff like that. And it was just fascinating to see stuff change so fast 
now it's even faster um, and just track what is changing, what people are saying. So I'm like, you know what? You know, I really love this community. I went to some conferences. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start tracking what are the most interesting discussions happening in our industry. Um, so I started the search and roundtable to basically keep a notebook of what the industry is talking about, uh, not really from a news perspective, but what the industry from inside the industry is talking about. So those who are very busy doing SEO every day and they have their day job, or maybe they're not as interested in the in the little like tidbits of you know finding their own information. Is I dug in through the different forums and pulled out the greatest content from those forums to kind of highlight that. And that was really the motive. That was the motivation there is to basically. Um, keep track of what the industry is talking about, put it on a blog. I can reference it back later because it's easy to search blogs and see, you know, archive that type of stuff. And then started, people started to read that blog and share it and stuff like that. So it kind of grained traction over the years. Um, so that was really the motivation. I still felt it was important for me not to offer SEO services because then over the years, Google started to like give me information that I really couldn't share with other people. So I think I have to earn the trust of both the search engines, Google, Bing, so forth, and also the SEO community by not, you know, offering SEO services where I kind of have this um, conflict of motivation interest. or yeah. whatever type of method to basically say, I'm going to write about, let's say, for example, I did a lot of, let's say I had an SEO company and I did a lot of link building. And one of the strategies I used was widget links, for example. And then Google came out with a, a, a widget link penalty. And I would then be biased and maybe write an article saying, well, Google says widget links are bad, but if you do widget links like this, then it's okay. Yeah. I don't want to write like that. I don't want to be biased by offering SEO services. I want to write um, articles around SEO and SEM based off of having zero bias um, on any front. People offer me money for blog posts. People offer me money for sponsorship. People offer, I will not take money in exchange for writing a blog post. Um, I've never had a paid um, sp uh, post on my site ever. Um, I do have ads. I do label them as ads. Any links are well, most, well sponsored, uh, which goes back. If you ever want to look at some history, you go to seroundtable.com slash links. And you'll see when Google first came out with the rel no follow, I was kind of stubborn and said, I'm not adding it uh, to my site. And it was kind of funny to watch the back and forth there. If you want to want to see some history there. Yeah. I, I have seen the, the whole page on transparency. Uh, I mean, at, at Rusty Brick or, at, or on your personal page and I'm also interested in you mentioned uh, Google Dances, as, as we used to call it. And what what do you remember as being the worst Google update uh, for you or for your clients? I mean, you mentioned you don't do that much SEO work, but maybe you know about uh, clients of your friends or so on. What which, which one was the worst? Was it Florida or was it recently Medic or anything else? So it's interesting. Yeah, so obviously um, I'm one of the I'm probably most well known for covering Google updates and tracking Google updates um, over the years. Um, I think the first time SEOs went like, whoa, like, oh my God, uh, was the Florida update in 2003, I think, 2000, yeah, 2003, or maybe 2004, forgot the actual date. The I, Florida I update was the first year. time, yeah, Google basically was like, did some type of update and Google SEOs were like, oh my God, all my SEO tactics like were destroyed. I'm not gonna rank well anymore. My business is, is shut down, I remember like, like news publications like the wall street journal and and so forth were like writing about how businesses went out of business because of this google update and it kind of like shook off the world saying you know what we can't put all our eggs in one basket we have to diversify we can't just create low quality websites um it's hard to say which one was the biggest impact florida definitely like you know told seos you know make sure you do things a little bit correct but then seos found other ways links and other ways to manipulate and then we had the Panda update, which was really big for Google. Google said it was, I think, about 12% of the search results were changed based off of that. Um, but I think the Penguin update, uh, which happened a year after that, um, impacted SEOs more than the Panda update. The Panda update impacted about 12% or so of search results when it first launched. The Penguin update, I think, was closer to like 3%. Uh, but I think it impacted almost more SEOs because SEOs were more focused around, at that time, link building. Um, and the Penguin update specifically impacted links and they really kind of discounted a lot of links um, and even pe penalized some types of links. So I think those were probably the biggest um, in terms of Florida, Panda, Penguin. And then you mentioned the Medic update, which Google initially was super angry that I called it the Medic update. I kind of named it and the SEO community was like, well, it's not just medical stuff. I'm like, well, it is. Um, and you can see that now. I mean, the Medic update was really around these core, it was really a core update. Um, 
And the core updates really focused around signals to say, is this site trustworthy? Is it authoritative expertise, like the EAT stuff? And obviously Google does not have an EAT score, but there's different signals that Google uses up to make up those types of signals. Um, and I think it first went and launched in a big way in the topic of YMYL, your money, your life. Uh, and that's really around site types of sites like our health focused, medical focused, um, you know, uh, medical sites like WebMD and those types of websites that give you actual health advice. Google will say, no, these types of sites that give medical advice um, need to be at a certain level of authority for us to trust them and rank them. Um, and you saw that then expand to financial services, then expand to all types of categories. Google's really pushing out um, these types of, I guess, EAT related signals across wider spectrums of, um, of um, different types of categories. I think it's obviously much more amplified and scaled up for topics around health and, uh, and finance versus maybe stuff about SEO is not as important, not life or death. Um, so I think, you know, if you had to classify them, I would say Florida was a wow factor. Panda, Penguin, and probably these core updates around Medic Update and so forth. Yeah. Um, so it was, for me, it was always sus kind of suspicious when I saw either agencies or freelancers, SEO freelancers uh, doing these ads for ranking guarantees, you know, for first position ranking. They would guarantee that you can, uh, I mean, an organic position that you would be first and do you think this is now kind of thing of the past that uh, seo is getting or has been getting harder even with all the core updates and the authority and and exactly as you mentioned your money or your life do, do you think that now we'll see or we are going to see less um, snake oil salesmen around seo or how, how's, how does the situation look like from your side yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely been the trend, especially if you look at the early days of the SEOs who were no more known as black hat SEOs that were looking for easy ways to manipulate the search results. There still are there. There are people out there now, but most of the famous black hat SEOs are now working for major corporations doing very, very white hat stuff. Um, they have their own large agencies doing very, very white hat uh, by the book stuff. It's not as easy as it was back in the very, not even close to as easy as it was back in the day to manipulate Google search. It was super easy back, you know, 15 years ago, but now it's, it's, you got to do things right. You got to really do things right. And if you try to manipulate it, it will catch up with you. Um, so you can go ahead and a lot of people do explore um, building what's called burner sites. They build a site. They don't care if it gets burned down and they rank well for a week or two. Um, sometimes those sites might rank well for a long time, but at the same time, Google keeps saying, just because the site's spamming and they're ranking well, it doesn't mean they're ranking well because of that spam. Google might be ignoring all that type of spam, all that, all those links, but it's ranking well for other things. Um, so it's really hard to say, you know, spam works, it doesn't. It might be things that they're really doing because the only way to fake, to fake really good success now is to actually pro provide really good content and really good website experience. So it's hard to say like, you know, oh, this site has tons of spammy links to it. They must be spamming Google. Google might be like ignoring all those links and they might have really great links also. Um, so it's really hard to, um, you know, say that. But at the same time, yes, you are 100% correct that um, SEO is getting harder, um, but it's also getting more official, more professional. And it's good to see the industry mature over these years. Yeah, I agree because at uh, that time it was more, as, as you mentioned, black hat SEOs and so on even gray hat, it was more of an experimentation field open to everyone. Lots of people were doing kind of SEO hacking and so on. So yeah, I think with all the rules that Google is now um, even publishing at their website, they started to publish uh, some, some guidelines for, for webmasters on SEO, I think years ago. So definitely the, the field has been maturing. So maybe on this topic that field is now kind of major and how is it for with with the new people do you think it's still kind of easy entry for people to uh, join seo industry or now they just need to know so much information and go into history and, and read about experiences of others that is actually the, the the steps to get into seo are now quite quite difficult do you, do you think we'll get more people into seo industry from people who are otherwise uninterested in maybe search engines and so on, but 
Um, I, I see this trend that uh, recently, I think PPC was more attractive for people to getting into online marketing because it was easier to start with. And, and SEO is, was, was uh, maybe recognized as a, a more difficult and, and yeah, with steeper learning curve. I'm not sure if that's necessarily true. I mean, I think the uh, PPC space, the Google ads environment, um, there's so much complexity there now. It used to be like you pay and you get ads and you rank very well and it was immediate. But now there's so much complexity around not just quality score, but there's so many different types of things around how Google uses AI and, and different me uh, methods to go ahead and rank those ads. There's lots of you know quality factors, lots of actual guidelines you got to go ahead and meet. So I don't think um, PPC is as easy um, as you as you think. Um, it's probably even I would think even sometimes a little bit harder to get into because there's so much more analytics involved. There's so much more you have to figure out ROI and budgets. Whereas SEO is more of a long term game. So you kind of you could kind of fake the SEO thing for a while before you get caught. Like you could say, I need six months, 12 months to actually see results. And a lot of people could easily get into SEO, not know what they're doing. And I see it all the time actually. Um, and say, oh, I'm gonna do an SEO audit. And they just take one of those SEO audit checklists and they go through the list. You know, how fast is your page? You know, core web vitals. Um, you know, how many links do you have? What types of, you can run all these reports. There's lots of tools out there that will give you an SEO audit in a matter of minutes. And so then you could go ahead and sell that. Um, and I think it's fairly easy still to get into SEO. Will you be a good SEO? No, I mean, you can't just wake up one morning and say, I'm doing SEO, I'm good at SEO. You could wake up one morning and say, I'm offering SEO services. And you probably, if you're a good salesperson, you could definitely get clients. Um, and, but the good SEOs really have results. Just, could you go out and wake up one morning and say, I wanna rank well for, I don't know, um, name the type of drug that's very popular right now. I don't know, whatever it might be. The answer is no, it's, it's super competitive now. It's much harder to be an affiliate um, SEO than it used to be back in the day, but it doesn't mean you can't get into SEO. There's new SEOs, you know, being trained all the time. Um, the SEO fundamentals are still the same as they always were. Great content that people want to link to, that people want to share, that you'd be proud of, that, you, that Google will be embarrassed not to rank. Um, and a lot of that has to do around, you know, overall marketing and content development um, and just going ahead and amplifying that content like you would with anything. When you open a brand new store, you want to amplify the marketing around that store. You want to create as much buzz as possible. It's the same rules apply. It's just not simple as basic SEO, you know, tactics where you just have to stick a title tag on the page and point some links to it from some type of link farm. It doesn't work that way anymore, but the same principles apply. We have seen some, uh, I would call, renaissance of SEO here among the big or large companies because before they didn't pay attention to SEO and now they are finding out that they have, I don't know, five websites or 10 websites and uh, they have just created a mess and, and they need uh, somebody that, who knows SEO to, to sort it out, not just because of the ranking, but also because of the cannibalization between the domains and so on because of the 404s that they have as a, as a legacy URLs have just stacked up and so on. Have you seen a similar trend in the US or how does it look like uh, there? That's true. I mean, as the best SEOs have those what we call war scars. They've dealt with penalties. They've dealt with major canonical issues. They've dealt with um, issues where, you know, they accidentally, you know, no follow their no index their website by accident. Um, I was on a phone call with a Fortune 500 company uh, a few years ago where they had a team of SEOs, maybe six SEOs in a room. And they said, we can't figure out our issue. I li literally sit down for the first, in the first 30 seconds, I view source on the page. I'm like there's a no index tag right there. That's why you're not, <laughs> it's sometimes you miss the obvious and sometimes you need to go through that process in order to be like, hey, this is you know experience. You only learn from this type of experience. And I think the best SEOs have gone through the most amount of, you know, negative experiences with, with what they've done over the past years. So um, I don't think it's necessarily a trend in one country versus the next. Um, it used to be where you would hear about SEO tactics that used to work in America early in the early days. Um, and then Google would crack down on that. And then it would still work in like other countries, mm -hmm. maybe different languages and so forth. Um, but it seems to be less, it seems like Google's much faster at either things get rolled out internationally quicker or they support more languages quicker. Or it's just um, the things that are the most obvious spam. Google's much better at, at, at handling. Um, there are still cases where Google doesn't roll out everything internationally. I think like 
with mum or the AI stuff, some of that language stuff needs to be tested first in English and then rolled out in different languages because of ling different languages handled um, are, are the different like ways of learning that type of stuff. So um, I do think, I don't think it's different in terms of, you know, that type, like people like that, like that catch up anymore. I think it's a lot quicker. At the same time, I think it also helps SEOs grow when they go through that process. And the only way to do that is to, um, you know, do SEO for a while. Um, one other point is that, you know, some SEOs, you know, don't want to do stuff that maybe pushes the, the that line, like that, you know, reaches over the gray line or whatever it might be. And they create their own websites and test it on their own websites without having to, you know, risk their client websites. And I always recommend that. And the number one thing is, if you're going to do something that you think might push that line, communicate that to the client, explain the risks and the potential rewards. And if the client wants you to go forward with that, then fine, but make sure to communicate those risks before you actually go ahead and try something that might be a little bit risky. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to remind our participants that they can ask you questions on Slido. So if we can maybe switch to Slido for now and see if there are any questions. Okay, so we have some questions. So let's start. Let's start with this easy one. What is your favorite SEO myth? Oh, easy one. Uh, my favorite SEO myth. Uh, there's so many. I don't even know where to start. Um, I can't stand a bunch. Of, I think the biggest one right now is probably the page experience update. People think an SEO company spends so much time, do so many audits, communicate to their clients, and put this fear around their customers that if they don't have a 100 score or they're all not green in the core web, in the page experience update or core web vitals that their rankings are going to drop, you know, and not rank well. It's not the case. The page experience update has very, very, very little impact on rankings. Uh, the desktop version just launched yesterday. It's going to have very, very little impact on any rankings. Um, so don't let, um, I mean, it's an easy thing for SEOs to sell. Uh, here's a metric. We want to do better on that metric. It's easy to the sell, but at the same time, it's a really small SEO um, factor. If anything, it's probably not even an SEO factor. So it's funny because it's like I wrote this on the Search Engine Land uh, title uh, newsletter yesterday, like do or this morning, um, doing SEO something like SEO. What was it? The title was um, doing SEO for S things that don't matter with SEO or something like that that have no SEO impact. And that's one of those things. It's like you know Google came out with this page experience update scared us all into like thinking that it's going to be a big update and then Google scaled that back. Usually the updates that Google pre-announces several months in advance are the ones that have the least impact on rankings. Mm -hmm. It's the ones that Google doesn't tell you about that sneaks up on you, like those Panda Penguins core updates that have the biggest impact. So maybe the page experience update um, is probably the, probably the most recent SEO myth that I would kind of dispel. Thank you. We have a question uh, from Walter who asks if there are any changes um, coming with Google updates, which you literally literally like and consider useful for better improving search results. Um, uh, so that's that's a tough one. Um, there's yeah. user interface changes, like you know, one of the questions of the shopping guides later on, or, or like feature snippets or videos, and bringing in what we call used to call universal results into the search results, which are definitely useful. I mean, but their ads are all plastered over anyway. You do a search for anything. First, you got to scroll down the ads. And then after that, you may get a local pack, you might get a feature snippet, you might get people also ask. Um, these are all things that Google obviously significantly tests to make sure, hey, are these um, user interfaces or features in the Google search results actually helping the searcher? And I consider they, I, I, I would trust Google would only launch stuff that helps um, searchers outside of the ads where they have to make money. But any other feature you see that um, is out there is, is driving better um, searcher behavior from what Google wants to see in terms of resulting in people being satisfied, coming back for more searches. I know we, you spoke to Rand Fishkin a, a month or so ago, um, and it's about the zero clicks and driving more searches to Google. But again, if Google just generates more and more searches and people aren't happy with those searches, they're going to go to another search engine. Um, so um, I think some of that data is kind of weird to, to talk about, but I think overall Google makes updates that they will do see a uh, benefit it with in terms of searchers being happier 
and searchers wanted to come back to Google to do more searches. Um, I think every change Google makes is tested significantly. And I think um, there's not one thing I could point to because I don't have access to Google's data. But I mean, if you look back, you know, like I said, 15 years ago, uh, it was so easy for me to manipulate Google and make my website rank for anything I wanted to, even though it wasn't relevant to that query. Um, and that's no longer the case. So obviously Google from 15 years ago to today is a totally different experience. And there's a, there's a recent article just this morning published, I think at the New York Times um, around how, um, hold on, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, basically about, uh, yeah, New York Times published it and basically saying how um, these, basically something around conspiracy theorists and how if you don't wanna use Google anymore, these conspiracy theorists um, are basically telling people to go to DuckDuckGo or Bing as an alternative. Um, they basically argue that, supposedly in this article, that um, these people, these conservative influencers are, and conspiracy theorists are like basically pushing people away from Google and big tech because there's some type of conspiracy. The truth is, if you read into the article, it goes through and says how Google is light years ahead of in terms of quality and, mm. and actual not serving up manipulative search results that are incorrect. Um, light years ahead of DuckDuckGo for sure, and also even Bing. So, I mean, if you take an analysis of that, I think often you'll see that Google is really, really doing a better job in terms of search quality. Of course, you know, they're the most, um, at these days, like hated, loved and hated company out there. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, Medic update, it's probably good that it happened uh, years ago. So they kind of smashed all the anti-vaxxer teams and so on. It wouldn't appear so, so, so much disinformation up there on the, on the first positions. So you mentioned also DuckDuckGo and Bing. Maybe hmm, do, you, do you work with those search engines as well or some other search engines when you are thinking in terms of SEO would these other search engines be part of that or now we just focus on Google and that's it? It's the always the thing. Do you, back in like early, like late 1900s, early 2000s, there were so many search engines. You would have this right. chart. I think Bruce Clay came out with a chart of like all the different search engines and you would basically base, try to optimize for each different search engine back then. Um, and you'd be able to use what's called cloaking or IP delivery based off of user agent to say, serve this, page to this search engine, serve that page to that search engine. But now if you look at anybody's analytics, you know, 90% plus of their traffic comes from Google, not from Bing, not from DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo is not even there. So SEOs are going to spend their time on what matters. And what really matters is Google search right now, not anything else. So yeah, you should have, you know, Bing and DuckDuckGo and those things on your radar, more so Bing, because Bing is driving a nice amount of traffic. I think Bing is actually, Bing actually powers DuckDuckGo for the most part. Um, so a lot of these search engines actually utilize other search engines for their search results. Um, that being said, I mean, yeah, you should have it on your radar, but I wouldn't worry about, you know, doing SEO individually for each search engine. It's really just focus on Google and the other search engines will catch up with that. Um, yeah. And so let's follow up with the next question is that Google has this kind of monopolistic uh, market share often close to 99%, especially in smaller countries like Slovakia. Although, for example, Czechia is an, is an exception because they have Seznam.cz, which is, I think, still maybe around 10%. But uh, so Rens, Rens' position when we had him here on uh, in Sales Ras, his, his position was that uh, we website owners, we the website owners or our clients need to start looking also away from Google and trying to find some new sources of their traffic, maybe improving their branding, maybe uh, using email marketing more and maybe some social channels and, and, and other channels just because Google, as you mentioned, is doing all these updates and has been doing all these updates and, and they, are, they have been adding their own services on top of uh, organic results and more ads on top of organic results. So what's your, what's your view on this? Uh, is, is Google really going to eat all the traffic from uh, the website owners or how, how yeah, it's going so, to? Yeah, so, yeah, I saw Rand's numerous studies. So, I mean, Rand's a great guy. I do, you know, I like him. I've known him since before he, before he first got into the SEO space with his yellow shoes and so forth. Um, there's a lot of history there with Rand that I think Maybe I know he genuinely cares about the search community. He genuinely cares about um, 
about, um, he really, I, I think he believes what he's saying and he means well, but at the same time, I don't think he's correct in these things. I don't think um, that, I don't think the zero, the, his studies is exactly accurate. Somebody searches for, for how tall is President Obama, you don't have to click through to see a site to get that. It's factual information. If you're searching for the weather, you get the weather. You, you know, you have to build content that is more detailed these days. And I think it's kind of short-sighted to like say, hey, um, Google's going to eat all my traffic. Yeah, I mean, Google's going to go ahead and provide these feature snippets. And I think every SEO, when first Google first launched that, I think every SEO was like, oh, that's evil. Google's taking my content and sticking it at the top and just quoting it. But I think every SEO would be like, I'd rather have that feature snippet and not have that feature snippet. If I see a competitor in the feature snippet spot for that query, I'm going to want that feature snippet, even if I'm position two or right under the feature snippet. So it's interesting how these types of views change when you're in that position of wanting to rank for that. Now, he's 100% correct in that you have to supplement your Google traffic. You have to make sure to you know get you know your email list, your newsletter email list you know as bulky as possible. You have to make sure to you know, do your social media ads. You have to make sure to do your, you know, search ads also. You have to make sure to do other forms of marketing because if one day, um, you know, either Google has a penalty that it hits your site and you no longer rank or competitors come up there or, I don't know, something blows up at Google search and there's no more Google search anymore, you need to diversify. There's no doubt about that. I just don't think um, saying that Google is going to eat all our traffic is something that helps Google. I think Google only lives in this ecosystem because there are publishers and websites out there that we and SEOs out there that are well optimized that give Google answers that could Google could then serve as search results to the searcher who's looking for the answer. And without that, and if we were, if Google doesn't have that, Google's not going to go ahead and be a great uh, search engine anymore. Um, so I think you have to think about. It. I think we kind of as SEOs think about it only from our perspective, but we also have to think about it from. Google search's perspective. What does Google search want to do to deliver the best type of search result to the searcher? And sometimes that means you shouldn't go ahead and try to build a website that is telling you how tall Barack Obama is or what the weather is or what the next movie listing is, because that type of stuff are just databases that anybody could buy and make a website out of. And in the old days, it used to be easy money, but easy money could be replicated very, very easily by anybody else or by Google. So I think that's where you have to kind of step back and say, what could I do that really nobody else could do or will have a hard time doing that I could do better? That type of stuff. But is this still true after they have built their um, knowledge graph? Even because some of the websites might have disappeared in the meantime, the information have been already uh, pulled from them and, and, and the knowledge graph is about, I mean, usually about the results or by the results. So is this still true that, yeah, I mean, we should create much better content and maybe deeper content on different topics because of course Google cannot um, cover everything. But uh, as you mentioned, that most of the information that are on Wikipedia or that are um, on databases like IMDB, Rotten Tomatoes and so on are already part of the uh, knowledge graph of Google. It is, and that's that's for sure. Um, and. Google, I guess, has given these one. Google's one of the top donors for Wikipedia and so forth. So, um, at the same time, that content is public; it's out there. Anybody can add to it. Anybody can manipulate it. Um, and again, I think there a lot of those feature snippets do have links to Wikipedia. I think a lot of not necessarily necessarily all the knowledge panels do. But if Google's not citing where that source is, that means Google supposedly licensed that data. Um, if they are not linking to it, Google generally says, hey, this is something we license. We, we, we actually purchase that feed of data from a provider. So maybe they're pro providing it. Maybe the IMDB is giving it to them. Maybe uh, one of these music places are giving them, you know, translate, um, you know, lyrics data. Um, and then Google sometimes gets caught with, you know, with their pants down where their provider is stealing data from somebody else. Um, it's, it's easy pointing fingers and everything without knowing the actual true story. I just think pointing figures and complaining about it all the time is not going to really help us that much. I think, especially if you're not in a rant's position um, or my position where you could actually go ahead and reach out to a lot of people and say, Google, you're doing something wrong. Um, I think you as, or anybody who's watching this as SEOs, you got to be like, all right, this is what I have today. I'm not going to complain. I'm going to go ahead and do what I can with what, what the, you know, the cards that were given to me are. 
and just complain about it. It's not gonna really make a huge difference. Google does listen to the feedback. Google has made changes to the user interfaces around publisher complaints. Um, Danny Sullivan, I know who I used to work with for many, many years, um, is now at Google. He is, believe it or not, advocating for the publisher. Um, he's giving them a viewpoint that maybe Google hasn't thought about it. And I think at the same time, even though Google might have not have our viewpoint, Danny Sullivan's there trying to give that viewpoint. We as SEOs and search marketers need to also understand Google's viewpoint so that will make us better at understanding what Google's end game is and how we can actually get there. Okay. Okay. So let's get uh, back more to the practical questions such as our participants are asking like what about tech seo what do you think we should pay attention to and what still actually works so i mean tech seo is very very important um it really depends it's it's hard to say on a in the, like on a general level what you need to focus on when it comes to tech seo every website that you look at has their own challenges some might be international based and they have to focus more on href length some might be uh, having URL structure issues, or some might be generating unlimited URLs without even knowing it. Some might have deleted all their category pages on 404 then by accident. Um, so I think every tech SEO challenge is unique in that you really need to understand how the content management platform or CMS that you use is producing those pages, understand how that actually interacts with Google search and make sure that what you're serving Google um, is what you want Google to actually see. Um, once you get to a point where your CMS is like great and everything is working as you expected, there's no really issues in terms of URL canonicalization issues or there's tons, I mean, you can go through a whole list. Um, then it goes about like, should you add schema and structured data? Where, how do you add that? What's according to Google's guidelines? And you should look at that. Your CMS probably can handle that. You can probably do that in a really good way. Um, and, and you kind of have to go through the, the steps to see, all right, everything is perfect in terms of not having any technical SEO issues. Now, how do I amplify my content through, you know, rich results using structured data? How do I um, maybe, you know, look at my my navigation and my internal linking structure? And how do I promote um, the pages that I think are the most important to my site so that Google sees that these are the most important pages? And then maybe that stuff ranks better because I'm only into linking into those pages from my higher level pages and so forth. So it's kind of, crawl budget is also one of those topics that I think is kind of, SEOs kind of obsess about when they really don't need to. Very few websites that SEOs work on have to worry so much about crawl budget. If you're working on a site as large as Amazon, sure, you need to worry about crawl budget. But if you're working on a 100, 200, 1,000, 10,000 page website, you probably don't need to worry about this crawl budget topic. And you're in the hundreds of thousands or millions of pages, sure. Um, so I think, you know, it depends on what the website is, what the current state is, but technical SEO is something that I think is very important. I think every SEO should um, have some type of understanding of what technical SEO is. I think it's very beneficial for SEOs to understand um, code. Um, I think that gives them a huge advantage for them to understand code, especially when you're getting into this whole new realm of, you know, JavaScript enabled sites, Angular, and all these types of frameworks. And how do Google's how does Google interact with that? There's a whole business of just that alone. So I think technical SEOs have a very you know, big advantage, of course, there's a need for technical SEO, there's a need for content SEO, um, you know, amplification SEO, like links and content marketing. Um, so there's a need for everything. But if you understand all of that very well, I think, you know, especially technically, I love technical SEO. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, all right. So now we have two questions about machine learning. So may maybe we can merge them. So what about machine learning content generation or artificial intelligence content generation? And um, I mean, this particular uh, participant is concerned about if this will work. And also what about if we just machine translate uh, parts of the content to other languages, will be Google okay with that? What, what's your view? Uh, so let's tackle both those questions. So what about um, AI content generation and machine learn, machine learn, uh, machine translated content? So. Let's start with the machine translated content. Google has said in their guidelines, the machine translated content. So you take an English piece of content and you translate it into, I don't know, French or whatever, um, then that piece of content should not be um, indexed. You should not let Google index that content. Generating machine translated content is against Google's guidelines in terms of Google doesn't want you to just have that page indexed. You could do whatever you want. You could add a widget to translate the content, but Google said, um, you have to either have a person a manual, I have to have a person actually manually translate that page for Google to, for it to be in accordance with Google's indexing. 
Um, that's what they say. Um, obviously, machine translated content is getting much, much better these days. Um, and Google has said, even when it comes to AI generated content, that one day uh, that might be something that Google will, will rank bit well. AI content um, is getting much, much better. And maybe in a year, two, five years, that con you know, maybe machines can write content better than you or I can. Uh, in that case, why wouldn't Google rank it? And Google's John Mueller and different players have said, yeah, I could see one day where machine generated content or AI based types of content will be something that Google tends to rank better. And that is concerning that, you know, you kind of see that, you know, you know, what if Google writes content themselves based on what it knows about the web? What if, um, you know, you know, what if I'm out of a job because I write a lot of content that I make much money writing about SEO, but what if, you know, somebody, you know, a machine could write SEO content better than I can. Um, and then you go from there, like news broadcasters and you have robots actually you see in, in different countries, I think in Japan and so forth, they're testing like machine AI based uh, virtual um, news, newscasters reading news and so forth. Um, it's the future. AI is the future. Will we have a Terminator where we all die and they take over the world? I don't know. Um, but I don't think it's something that SEOs need to be too concerned about. I mean, there are a lot of SEOs that are like, how can I improve my content using AI? Um, you know, what, what tools can I find that will help me make better content by looking at what else is on the web, what's currently ranking on the web for those topics, or what information do I need to put in my content to kind of compete with what's already ranking there? And there's a lot of cool tools that are using AI to kind of tell you that. Um, and pulling from the knowledge panel, pulling from uh, IMDB and getting all this supplemental information that when you write an article about what's going on with Russia and Ukraine, I'm not sure if that's something we should talk about, um, but if, you know, if somebody's writing an article about that, they could get a pretty big picture using these tools about what's important to the user on this topic and what supplemental information do they need to put in that article to make it something more beefy, which is kind of funny. Uh, this kind of takes me off on a tangent on it's funny how Google wants you to write the most long winded piece of content, like really depth, deep piece of content that goes on and on and on and on. But nobody wants to read that. The search, Google knows the searcher doesn't want to read that. And that's why they have these feature snippets that have summarized everything at the top. So it's like Google wants what's best for the user, but they want you to write these really long articles. And then Google knows that the person is not going to read it anyway. Um, I kind of think at one point Google might go ahead and start, start rewarding shorter, more to the point pieces of content in the future. But it's, I wonder if that's going to change or not. Anyway, some of the tangent. They have been at least trying with Chrome to have an option to skip to the content they are actually displaying in the snippets, right? So maybe that's their way for now. But uh, this machine, I mean, machine learning or AI generation, content generation is kind of history repeating because we had uh, Blackhead SEOs doing this maybe in two th around 2005 with Markov chains, if I'm not uh, mistaken, with algorithms that had nothing to do with AI because AI was nowhere to be reachable, normal, normal computers. But um, they have been doing it at some point. Of course, it was for spamming Google at that time because it was easy to spam Google. But as you mentioned, then now maybe even the large media will start... Uh, um ai generate the content i think it was new york times then maybe they tried to generate uh, short news on on some sports results something like that if i remember correctly anyway okay so what about okay so maybe you can do a little bit of uh self-promotion here what blogs or media do you follow to stay on top of seo knowledge and trends <laughs> Oh, um, that's a hard, I mean, I follow uh, hundreds or thousands of sources every single day. So, so um, except for search engine round table and search engine land that you probably don't follow, but because you write it, but. <laughs> so I, I, I can't point out one or two. I literally follow um, hundreds of sources on the internet, including Google alerts and searches. I follow tons of people on Twitter and social media. Um, I have a newsletter that actually every single day, I probably put about, I don't know, 50 links to different sources every single day about new pieces of content. So if you wanna see what I follow, I would say, you know, check out the newsletter or subscribe to the feed um, to see all those different sources. Some of it's, you know, major publications like New York Times, routers and whatever. And some of it's like small little blogs that you may not have heard of, uh, but I don't wanna specifically point out one or two. Um, just, you know, subscribe to that feed and you'll see it. 
That, that's fine. That's fine. Would you would you recommend also reading through Google documentation, being documentation, possibly other search engines, because they have large knowledge bases and uh, at least uh, Google has everything well covered, I think, in terms of SEO, right? So it's insane. In the past couple of years, Google has totally you know, blown up in a really good way, their documentation. It used to be like documentation is all over the place um, and you would get better information from, you know, third-party blogs and mm -hmm. resources. Google's developer SEO search resources are amazing. Um, so I would definitely start there. Their quality raters guidelines is something you should print out. It's pretty big. Read it on the weekend while you're at the beach or whatever. Um, Google has a SEO starter guide. It's great starter guides out there just to do a search for SEO starter guide. I think you have some from Moz and there's lots of old books out there as well. Right. Um, there's lots of great resources that are freely available on the web to kind of start with SEO. Right. Okay. So we have quite an interesting question here on the importance of SEO and content mar marketing. So um, somebody asks that even in tech industry, they sometimes don't get the importance of SEO and content marketing. How, what, what would you do to convert someone or convince someone to persuade them to invest into SEO or at least put some budget into SEO uh, activities? Um, I mean, there's lots of tools out there that will estimate how much traffic you would get. Um, probably the fastest way to convince somebody, uh, our client, that SEO is important and content marketing is important is to do a paid search campaign first. Show them how much traffic that Google or Bing could drive to your website from search and show them how much it cost them over that period of time and saying, if we did an SEO campaign over the course of six to 12 months, you could get that result organically for free. It might cost you this in SEO, but it will cost you this with paid search. Um, and maybe, you know, after they see that traffic and the conversions from that traffic, which is obviously paid search is more real time, you can convince them that that traffic will convert, lead to a nice ROI, um, and generate a lot of business for them. So I think the easiest way to do that is, you know, to really show them in a paid search campaign, just show them how much traffic they get quickly and then translate that to SEO and content marketing afterwards. Okay, another question is that, uh, what's your take on the connection of Google now going after shopping guides? Because they are they have been testing new SERP, I think you just posted that recently as well. Um, taking more content on the top. And so what, what should the, maybe the webmasters, the affiliates, the niche websites do now when, when Google will kind of push more content on top of the organic results for this kind of segment? It's a good question. Um, I, think SEO, I think affiliates and SEOs need to just close up shop and leave. No, I'm just joking. Um, it, it's, it's hard. That's so new. I don't know how much that's going to expand, but it was so the quality of that shopping guide was like so insignificant it wasn't like i would get enough information to buy something um it didn't show enough i mean i saw like a lot of examples of it it was kind of like it was just like why are you bothering obviously google's probably just testing it to see what would happen um but i think google needs to do it. you see that google has a lot of cool comparison charts these days they've been doing that for years um the shopping guide i think is the least thing that people have to worry about because i think it's so limited that people are still going to click over to i don't know I mean, it's funny because like years and I mean, five years ago, three years ago, SEOs were like, oh, we got to build these shopping guides for everything. So, you know, best camera shopping guide and best uh, mobile phone, best, I don't know, chair. And everything. SEOs created all this shopping guide content. Yeah. And, that's, and Google's like, you know what? It's not really that valuable. I mean, or maybe they are. So it's just, it's just funny to see SEOs like jumping on the next thing. And then Google's like, you know, push it back. And then SEOs are always going to find something new. It's just a trend where SEOs find this. Google says no, SEO finds something else. Google says no. It's just this trend of like SEOs do something and the SEO something. And then Google's like, no, no, no. And then it's rinse and repeat on something new. But I think these shopping guides are pretty limited right now. It's hard to say, you know, is this going to go ahead and kill affiliate marketers? I think no is the answer, at least now. But, um, you know, affiliates and Google have not had a good history even since the Florida update back in 2003. So I, I think it's affiliates always find a way. It's harder, but I best the best affiliates always you know, end up, you know, winning big when it comes to these Google updates. So just keep doing what's best that you think for the user. And I think ultimately you'll be fine. All right. Thank you. Um, do you have some kind of life hacks or tips for international SEO? Is there anything more to pay attention to, except for we are doing already tech uh, content and link building? 
Um, I mean, it's it's the HRF Lang stuff. It depends on how if you need it or not. Um, there's no real international hacks outside of that HRF Lang stuff. Obviously, language has to be written by somebody who knows the language. I don't think I have any specific international hacks, SEO hacks per se. All right. Okay, maybe maybe more about your experience with like large websites and how to. You mentioned but um, the crawl budget and. Uh, and maybe limit that Google puts on large websites because yeah, they have many languages, many different ver versions. Um, do you, have you worked with uh, large companies like this consulted maybe? Do you have uh, some tips? What, what were the usual mistakes? So usually the, the bigger websites, their issues are not, it could be somewhat crawl budget related, but it's mostly around their pagination structure mm -hmm. and categories subcategories when google should index those filters and like if you want to start filtering like pages of i don't know um i don't know earphones and you want to base filter them by color or by size or by type at what point do you have like 400 pages of filters for it for the keyword earphone earphones blue earphones big earphones small earphones loud ear at what point is it too much i think that's the biggest issue and then how many pages of results the whole thing when Google released the Rel Next Rel Prev and got rid of that feature, uh, where you could actually say this is the set of pagination in this result, that kind of threw everybody for a loop. So I think the biggest issues that large sites have, especially e-commerce sites and also large news sites, is how do I get certain products and category landing pages to rank well amongst other ones? And that's always a trial and error thing. It's nothing. There's no simple answer to say do it this way or index all my pages or index 20% of my pages. It's really a trial and everything where you say, let me try to get these this 5% of these types of pages or category pages indexed, see if Google likes it, ranks it, and then maybe we should try another 5% or whatever it might be. So it's a lot of that stuff. There's no simple answer. It, every OS site's different and you kind of have to test it constantly. And then Google might release some type of update or change how it crawls your website and that might have an impact. And just recently I wrote about how Google said that a lot of people put paginated results. And often on new sites, the new stuff is first on that pagination. But when it comes to e-commerce sites, sometimes the new products you add to that paginated set of results is maybe at the end. And Google might not even pick up on it. So you kind of have to think about like, Google's not crawling to page 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 on that paginated set of results. So how can you get Google to find the content that's on page 9, 10, 11 of that paginated set of results? And those are the types of things maybe you find, maybe you build these buyer guides like we were talking about before. Do you have a page that kind of highlights that type of stuff? So a lot of that stuff is really a lot of trial and error when it comes to how does Google find all the content on my website, especially the content that I want to rank well. Thank you. I think we have slowly come to an end of our session. So maybe last question for you is, uh, what do you think we should expect uh, or wait in future of uh, search engine changes and SEO? changes uh is it just will it be just business as usual or or some even larger updates are coming i mean you can always expect larger updates from google i mean we'll still have more core updates um i think google will constantly push us as webmasters site owners to build better sites for users i think a lot of those pushes will have a small impact on overall rankings just this morning i reported about or last night i reported about how Google Merchant Center is going to give or potentially may give sites that provide an excellent customer experience, um, a boost in rankings and more visibility through a badge and other methods in the shopping tab of Google search. Now, how does Google get that, um, um, that data to say, this is a, sh a great shopping experience? Google saying, give us that data through an API feed, tell us. Yeah. And now you're going to trust the, the merchant to tell you, hey, I'm providing a great customer experience. You can fake that data. So SEO, like I said, SEO is going to use that information, send Google the information they want to hear, hopefully benefit from that. And then Google's going to pull it back and say, no, we don't trust that information anymore. Just when they launch XML sitemaps back in the day and they say, give us a priority score for each URL. And every, every SEO is like, every URL on my website is a priority number one. Google doesn't look at that signal anymore. So I think you'll see more of the same where Google is going to release you know, things. SEO is going to SEO it to death. Google's going to scale it back. We had that with rich results where everybody was putting stars everywhere. Google's like, well, we're not going to trust all the sites now anymore because there's too many stars all over the place. Um, so it's just that rinse and repeat type of thing where Google's constantly like tweaking things and you got to, you got to stay on top of it. Like the shopper guide, is that going to grow or is that going to go away? Um, these user, I don't, I report a lot about user interface changes. 
not because not only because I think they're fun to watch, but also because user interfaces have a major impact on how Google will display your search results in the landscape. So I think it's important for everybody to stay on top of those user interface changes because without following those things, you don't know where what Google's trying to do and where Google's going. Um, it might not they might not go there, but just Google, a Google understanding that Google's testing something might give you some insight into where they want to go in the future. And I think the best SEOs are on top of that type of stuff. And they always think about obviously the user and the customer experience, uh, but at the same time, they just provo- they want to basically, they say this all the time, you want to be where like a Wayne Gretzky thing, you want to be where the puck will, you know, skate the, where the puck will be um, so they can score better. And that's what SEOs are doing. They want to be where Google wants you to be before Google programs something that could they could determine if you'll be there or not. So I think just keep focusing on the user. It's more of the same, but you know, I don't think we're going to have like the Florida update or the Panda updates anymore. The core updates are drastic if you get hit, but I think they're much more tame than they used to be when it, when it came to the Panda or Penguin updates, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for joining us. This was another session of uh, SEO's Rust, uh, virtual again. Our, our guest was Barry Schwartz, Rusty Brick, and also SEO Rusty Brick company and uh, we'll post the recording on YouTube. You can subscribe for following us for other sessions. And yeah, thank you, Barry, again, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Bye-bye.